Let me read out of Hebrews chapter 11, our scripture verse for this morning as we get into what God has for us. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 to 22 say this, By faith Abraham, when tested, excuse me, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. And by faith, Joseph, when, he was, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. This summer, as you know, we've been going through Hebrews chapter 11. And again, I said at the beginning of our sermon series, the author of this book takes into account an understanding that his audience knows the stories, previously already understands the stories in which he quickly glosses over and describes. So I'm going to take that same liberty this morning that we're going to gloss over much of these stories with a, at least a, an understanding that you know by names who Abraham is, who Jacob is, who Isaac is, who Joseph is. I'm going to take that liberty with us this morning because that's one family. It's essentially Abraham and his son Isaac and then Isaac's son Jacob and then Jacob's son Joseph. And the author goes through this lineage of generations in Hebrews chapter 11. Four generations that he glosses over in four sentences. We're talking hundreds of years glossed over in a quick, short breath. Much of what this morning is going to look like, because we've taken seven weeks so far to go through the first half of the book of Genesis. And we're going to take the next 17 minutes to go through the second half of Genesis this morning. So theoretically, those in the chairs here and those physically in your cars, you can buckle up because we're going to go through this pretty quickly, okay? <laughs> so Abraham, we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. Abraham was called by God. He had a cost that he had to sacrifice and give up. And there was a covenant that God made with Abraham. He made a promise with him and with Sarah calling both of them the father of nations and the mother of nations. And the promise that God made to Abraham and to Sarah, specifically to Abraham, he said, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. All the people on earth will be blessed through you. So there was this promise that God made with Abraham about his son, that he would have an heir. And from that moment of promise to the moment of blessing, of fulfillment of that promise, was 25 years Abraham wandered and walked and believed and doubted and struggled and survived until the point where the promise came into fulfillment and he had an heir, Isaac. So celebration, excitement, gladness. He has his son and the promise of God is now realized and physical in front of him. And Abraham loved his son, Isaac. Then it says sometime later, God tested Abraham. And I'm certain many of you know this story. Abraham had to take Isaac and sacrifice him. Make a sacrifice before the Lord. And it says in Genesis, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago when that call to Abraham? He said, go to the area that I will show you. Go to the land I will show you. Here's the same repetition of style of call. He says, go make the sacrifice on the mountain that I will show you. So again, before a sign... God is asking for submission. Before an opportunity, God is seeking obedience in Abraham's life. And the author in Hebrews, he says the words, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. Because there's a conflict here of interest, right? There's a promise of God that your descendants, your heir is going to be the blessing of the world, that nations will come, that they'll be more numerous than the stars in the sky, more numerous than the sands on the beach, from your descendant, your seed. So there's the promise. Now there's a command that you're to sacrifice that heir. So there's a conflict of God's promise and God's command 
And Abraham was obedient to both. He was faithful to both. But they're at conflict at one another. And the author of Hebrews says Abraham reasoned that God could even raise anyone from the dead. Like we hear stories, of course, of Christ, we see in scripture and others who were raised from the dead. At this time for Abraham, there was no one who had been raised from the dead. So to have faith and belief in something he has never, ever witnessed or seen before is Father Abraham. And so ultimately, Abraham followed through. Followed through in the promise and the command, even though we're, they were in conflict with one another. He reasoned that God could work out all the details. So he brought Isaac up to the mountain. And right before he's about to sacrifice him, he finds what in the thickets? A, a ram. God stops him and says, I've provided a sacrifice for you. And then it says in Genesis 22, an angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. And said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars and the sky and the sands on the seashore. God's promise of blessing because of Abraham's obedience not only affected his life, but the generations of his family to come. Isn't that amazing? So I've titled today's message, Faith is Generational Blessing. Abraham's obedience and trust and faith in the Lord blessed him and his children and his children's children and following along through the generations. The author in Hebrews, he says, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regards to their future. This is such a wild story. Even to this day, I still struggle with it. So in Hebrews, it says Isaac, that was again, the son of Abraham, had Jacob and Esau. They had twins. But the order of the names is Jacob and Esau, which is intentional. But the firstborn out of the two is not Jacob. It's Esau. Esau was the firstborn. And if you know the story, um, when Rebekah, Isaac's wife, was pregnant uh, with the twins, they jostled in her tummy. And the Lord spoke to Rebekah. And said that these two, there will be war at one another because the younger will overtake the older. And so they jostled continuously in her belly. And when they were born, do you know what happened? Jacob was holding the what of Esau? His heel. Holding on to the heel of Esau as they were born. And so there was this constant control that the younger desired to have over the older. And the story unfolds and there is... There's some major dysfunction in the story of Isaac and his kids. Jacob and Esau, very different from one another. His wife, Rebecca, played a bit of a, a difficult scheme on her husband, Isaac. So as Esau, Jacob's favorite firstborn, was out in the, sorry, Isaac, excuse me. Esau, Isaac's favorite, he sent him out into the fields to go catch game and to feed him because he was going to bless his oldest son. And at home, Rebecca and the younger of the twin siblings, Jacob, Rebecca wanted Jacob to have the blessing because of what the Lord said to her while the kids were in her belly. And so they came up with this devious plan, this scheme to make their will come true. Yes, it was God's promise, but they, in a devious way, persuaded and lied to Isaac. So in Isaac's old age, he's about to bless his son Esau, his firstborn, who in the lineage order would receive the firstborn blessing from his father. Sends Esau out to the field. And while he's out in the field, Rebekah and Jacob, they put goat skin on Jacob because he had soft hands and soft skin. And he roughed up she roughed up his skin and made him smell like a hunter because Jacob stayed home and didn't go out hunting. And convinced Isaac in his old age where he was blind that he was actually the firstborn, Esau. And so Isaac blesses Jacob, not Esau, with a blessing of great reward, of great fruit, of a hope and a plan for a great future. And it isn't just a blessing of goodwill and hope that it's, you know, you're going to do well. 
But this is, a, this is a prayer and a prophetic word that Isaac spoke over his children that would make a difference into who they would become as adults and into their future and into their lives. He says, may God give you heaven's dew and earth's riches, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and people bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. And so Isaac blessed Jacob the second born, with the first born blessing. And you think, well, how does this represent faithfulness? How does the author of Hebrews write about Isaac and his faithfulness in a blessing that shouldn't have been in that direction, in that order, because of the devious plan of Rebekah? Well, Isaac stayed true to his word. When he found out that when he gave Jacob the blessing rather than Esau, the realization came about and he couldn't believe it. Yet he kept to his word. He blessed Esau as well. But he gave Jacob, the firstborn, the greater blessing. And he was faithful to that blessing. Faithful to what God had ordained in his life. Now Rebecca's faith lacked. But Isaac's faith is where the author of Hebrews reveals his strength. Ultimately it resulted in God's blessing for Jacob. But it also resulted in consequence too. Resentment for years in the family. Jacob, who became the nation leader of Israel, and Esau, who became the nation leader of the Edomites, were at war with each other for generations to follow. How often do we do the same thing? We want to take things into our own hands. We want that control. Ah, things are taking too long. I kind of want it my way, and we force our hands and try to manipulate God's will for our lives. And there's times where I've been guilty of that, where I need to surrender and say, Lord, not my will, but yours. Your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are greater. And so even through the deception, Isaac was still faithful in giving the blessing to his children. So his son, Jacob, the one who jostled, the one who held the heel of his older brother, the one who wanted control. He lived a life where he constantly was in that internal conflict of wanting control. He also wrestled the Lord. The only person that we read about in Genesis, in Scripture, who actually wrestled with, an, with the Lord or an angel who represented the Lord. And in that wrestling match, the Lord did what to Jacob? He took out his hip and injured him. Took out his hip and he changed his name. And he changed his name to Israel. And in that name change and in that wrestling match, he gave meaning and purpose to him and his future. Israel actually means to be a wrestler with God. That's what the Israelites were. They were God wrestlers. That's who we are as children of God. We, we wrestle with God. Our life is a, is a wrestle. It's a journey of faith with the Lord. So Jacob, as he, as he grew up, he was a bit of a hot mess <laughs> in much of his story that we read in Genesis. So Jacob has 12 sons. Jacob is the grandson of Abraham, and he's got 12 sons through a myriad of different ways in which he received those sons. You can read about it in Genesis. And so the man in whom God brought about his blessing and the, and the future of, of the Israelite nations, the, the leader of Israel, he brought through a person who was a hot mess, who wanted control, who struggled and succeeded. And you think, really? Like, this is the guy? The one who jostled for control and is stubborn? This is the guy that the Lord is choosing to bring about his will and his blessings? And God used him. The writer in Hebrew focuses at the end of his life. He learned a few things by the time he got to his old age. And the author of Hebrews focuses specifically on when he blessed his next generation. So he had his 12 sons and one specific son, his son Joseph. Joseph had two sons. And so Joseph brought his two sons, Jacob's grandkids, to him and said, bless them. And so Jacob was going to bless, Israel was going to bless his grandkids. And maybe you know the story. It's a bit of a funny one. I think of like a family reunion. You know those family reunions where they're kind of awkward, but it's great to see each other. You don't see each other all that often, so you're really glad, but you just, it's also just weird, right? Uh, there's a moment that happens in this family reunion. 
So Joseph brings his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, to Jacob. And Manasseh, being the older one, he brings to Jacob's right-hand side so he can bless him as the older son and receive the greater blessing. And then he brings Ephraim to the other side, his left-hand side, to get the second-tiered blessing. And Jacob, <laughs> in his old, wise age, this time submitted to the will of the Lord, knowing what the Lord had called him to do, he takes his hands and he crosses them over to bless the younger rather than the older. And here's the awkward moment. You know what Joseph does? He grabs Jacob's arms and tries to uncross them so that the older son gets the greater blessing and the younger son gets the lesser blessing. And they have this like wrestling match where he's crossed over arms, praying this blessing over his grandchildren while Joseph is trying to swap them back. And is this Jacob still trying to gain control in all that's going on? No, I don't think it is. Because at the end of Jacob's life, I think he was tired of the jostling. I think he was tired of the stubbornness. He was tired of the controlling. He was done fighting. Because the final picture that we get of Jacob is him peacefully leaning on a staff of his, worshiping the Lord and giving blessing to his grandchildren, Joseph's kids. He learned finally to trust God rather than to control everything in each situation. So the author of Hebrews, he focuses on the blessings because of Abraham's obedience. There's blessings in his son, Isaac. Because of Abraham's obedience, there was blessing in his grandson, Jacob. And because of Abraham's obedience, there's blessing in his great grandson, Joseph. And I'm going to, all I'm going to say about Joseph is this. The story of Joseph continues on in this wild family trajectory of mess and chaos and sometimes weirdness. So the 12 brothers of Israel, they sold one of their brothers into slavery to Egypt, Joseph. And through the sovereignty of God, he was saved and protected. And through that protection and salvation, Joseph rose to power and influence in Egypt as an Israelite, as a Hebrew, who would have had no reason to be in any place of influence in Egypt at all. God rose him to this place of prominence. So that when famine struck the land, guess who brought salvation to the Hebrew nation? Joseph did in Egypt. God used Joseph in this weird, awkward slave trade reason that brothers sold off their son, brought to prominence, and they brought Israel in to health and to security and food and abundance and possession. Once Joseph passed, things turned terrible for the Israelites again. <laughs> But here's the crazy thing. The generations of generations we see of God's people through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. Disaster. We see deception. We see lies. We see hurt. We see separation and pain. We see darkness. Remember that moment when Abraham was in that dark place that we talked about a couple weeks ago? It says, just following that dark depression that Abraham, God spoke to him. He said, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not of their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish that nation and serve that they serve as slaves. And afterwards, they will come out with a great possession. Hundreds of years earlier, generations earlier, God promises this destruction on Israel. But he promises salvation on them too. And this is the whole point of the picture. Why I wanted to bring confusion and misunderstanding. Like why would God bring his blessing through this kind of a mess of a family? <laughs> is this. Through Abraham's obedience. Through Abraham's faithfulness. Through Abraham's trust. Hebrews author said that he reasoned that God could even raise the dead. He reasoned that God could do the impossible. That no matter how chaotic the situation gets, how dire and desperate a situation may be, to that of enslavement, to that of lying, to that of deception, God's will and sovereignty is still in control. 
If his command and his promise may seem at odds with each other. Yes, there may be confusion, but God's sovereignty and will is still in control. If there's confusion in your life and wonder, God, why is it like this? We can trust that God is sovereign and his will is greater than our will. Amen? Amen. I'm going to invite the band to come on up here. Like how often do we think, oh man, their life is just, it's kind of all together. They've just kind of got it made. It's perfect. Generations of family, of born again believers, of Christians who have served the Lord for years and years and years. Talking about Nanus Bay Camp when Thomas mentioned that they were there for three weeks. Rebecca and I have been staying there over the summer. Our son Seth, he was a camper at Kids Camp. He was the fourth of her family's generation at this camp. Her grandfather, her parents, herself, and our son have all been campers at this camp. So generations of faithfulness, and you think, wow, that family must have it all together. And then my family, where, where I came out of a non-Christian, broken family, single parent, and found salvation through Jesus, and, and thought, man, her family must have it all together. And boy, was I wrong. Uh, right? Every family has its mess. Every family has its dysfunction. Every family has its disorder. I think of, of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Did you know, this is something that I learned this week. Paul mentioned he learned something new last week. This is something I learned new this week. Of each of those children, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, they received God's blessing. None of them were the firstborn. Isaac was not the firstborn. Jacob was not the firstborn. Joseph was not the firstborn. Of the women who gave birth, Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel, all of them were barren to begin with and needed to receive prayer and God's blessing for them to become pregnant and give birth to a child. There was dysfunction and disorder from every angle, and yet God still chose them and used them to bring about his will. Doesn't that give hope for us? Right? Amen. That through the dysfunction and the disorder that God is still with us and his will will still take place and see follow through in our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? My one point for the message today is Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. He reasoned that God could do the impossible. And so in the conflict of his promise and command, he was faithful and obedient. And his obedience brought blessing, not just upon his life, but upon his children, his grandchildren, and his great-grandchildren, and descendants to follow. And so for you, I th I'm, I'm calling parents right now, and grandparents right now. Your response of obedience, your response of faithfulness, your response of trusting in the Lord's sovereignty, even in a dire situation, can play in seeing blessings take place in your children and your children's children and their children's children. Amen? Amen. 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 Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you are still alive and active and at work today, bringing blessing and bringing hope in this world today. Even in a chaotic situation that we find our society and our nation in, in this moment, we believe still that you are sovereign, that you are king, that you are over and above all, and that your will will take place through any circumstance. Jesus, we believe that you have given us a promise a promise of salvation and that you are coming to return again. And so today we celebrate knowing, proclaiming, declaring that there is new life in people's lives today. And as we uh, soon move to baptism, Lord, we want to acknowledge that it is only because of you, because of your grace and mercy in our life. We respond in faith, but it is through your love that you brought about new life and new creation into Billy and to Kelly's life. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your name.